Ladies and gentlemen, Boyan Slat, who is his main aim, purpose, ambition, and goal is to clean up the world's oceans. He's going to tell us how. Boyan Slat, ladies and gentlemen. Before we begin, thank you. Thank you, sir. They're still signing up. Before we begin, don't forget this is your last chance to ask questions, so you can do it through the app. Um, anybody watching here now, you know, look, I'm a man of a certain age. How old are you? Uh, 23 years old now, yeah. Getting old, I know. Yeah. Shall I hit him now or later? <laughs> Twin, I think I've got T-shirts older than you, boy. <laughs> um, all right, now, I want you to describe, because I want to talk about bigger issues. I want you to describe the fundamental idea of what it is ocean cleanup is. And we're looking here, at, uh, as you can see, sure. at this graph of this map of the world. Explain your idea. Sure, yeah. So, so there are five areas in the world where ocean plastic concentrates. Uh, and the largest one is called the, uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is an area we see uh, between Hawaii and California. So about half of the world's ocean garbage is concentrated in that one area. Um, and people proposed to clean it up in the past, but uh, they all thought about using boats and nets to sort of go uh, fishing for plastic, as it were. Uh, but this will take uh, quite a long time, uh, 79,000 years to be exact. So, um, yeah, I'm even, quite you, even you would be old by I then. Would, yeah, I mean, I'm quite patient, but not that patient. So, um, and it would also be very expensive, hundreds of billions of dollars, etc. So then I thought, well, these ocean garbage fetches, they, mo they move, the plastic doesn't stay in one spot. So why would you go through the ocean if the ocean can also go uh, through you? So what we then devised was an, um, sort of an artificial coastline there where there are no coastlines. So um, in other words, um, we have these very long floating barriers. Maybe you have an, an image of that too. So um, it's basically a, um, a U-shaped uh, floating barrier that acts like a funnel to first concentrate the plastic before we take it out. Um, so in other words, it's sort of like a, an automatic vacuum cleaner but uh, actually powered by the natural ocean current. So uh, what happens is that the plastic moves around. These cleanup systems, they also move around. Uh, but the cleanup system, they move slightly slower than the plastic. Was there a eureka moment when you were thinking about this? I mean, most people don't wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to build an ocean cleanup system. Yeah, uh, that's quite correct. Um, yeah. Um, so. Uh, there was this, uh, this one moment, so I've always been sort of an inventor, you know, been making things since I was two years old. First it was you know, tree houses, zip lines, then computers, then rockets uh, when I was 12. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that wasn't for use. It was fun, it was lots of fun, uh, except for the neighbors. But um, it was lots of fun, but it wasn't very useful. But then one day, I was, uh, I was 16 years old, I was diving in Greece, and I saw more uh, plastic bags than fish around me. And uh, then I thought, well, why can't we just clean this up? And that simple question start, sort of started circling in my head day after day. And then after, I think, one year of thinking, I, of you know, putting different ideas uh, together, uh, eventually came up with this, this, uh, this idea to, uh, to passively clean the ocean. And you have gone so far, because we want to talk bigger issues yeah. as well. You've gone so far as to uh, have actually done some trials. Explain exactly the current situation. Where sure. do we stand at the moment? Yeah, so um, we were founded three years ago. Um, and uh, since then, I think we, we raised about $35 million to, to be able to really do two things. And on one side, it's, um, it's really the reconnaissance, so understanding the problem. So, so what we've done is we've, uh, we've crossed this patch with 30 boats and an airplane at the same time to really map it, to know how much is out there, how big it is, how deep it is, etc. So we really understand the problem now. And on the other side, we've done the testing. So we've done uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of scale model tests. Uh, we've done prototypes to ensure that in case a hurricane crosses it, it doesn't get destroyed, for example. Uh, and now we are preparing to actually deploy the first 
full-scale cleanup system um, by uh, early next year. Who's funding it? Uh, if, you, if we have a question from uh, Ronnie Jungenken, how do you finance your cleanup? How do you make it economically sustainable? And the reason, of course, everybody will say this is a marvelous idea, but we're a business forum. Exactly. And you may be an environmentalist, but I assume you're an entrepreneur and a businessman too. Sure. Um, yeah, so, so, so far, to really fund the, uh, you know, the R&D, the initial exploration work, uh, we've been supported by some, some great um, entrepreneurs, people like Mark Benioff, Peter Thiel, you know, lots of Silicon Valley and, and, and Europe as well. Uh, but that, uh, that only takes you so far, right? Um, so the idea is for this, for this scale-up, eventually we'll have 60 systems out there. Right now we have enough capital to at least build the first one to prove the technology. Uh, but to do that scale-up, we really have two parts. So the, the initial investment to get them out there and the operational cost. So the initial investment, we want to get out of the way by partnering with companies, so companies can put their logo on it. It's a, these systems are one kilometer in size, so there's plenty of space for logos. Um, the world is watching. So, so that's at least to get them out there. And then to, to keep them operational, the, um, that cost we want to get out of the way by actually recycling the plastic, selling that to companies, and they can make their own products, and that's how we fund the cleanup. So you're going for a purely private sector solution here. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, wouldn't yeah. you prefer it if, maybe they would, or maybe they wouldn't, governments picked up the bill? Or am um, I just being lunatic? I mean, they are welcome to buy their systems too, uh, if they want to take responsibility. If there's any, any prime minister in the room, feel free to uh, send an email. Um, <laughs> or, or tweet, we're also on Twitter. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, the thing is that I wouldn't like to be reliant on it because, right. of course, governments are notoriously slow and bureaucratic, etc. Um, so, you know, what I like about entrepreneurs and companies is that they can make decisions quickly. Where did this come from? I mean, this is an extraordinary... You and I have met before when you came on Quest Means Business yeah. in, in New York. Um, this is a very grand idea for solving, well, in the sense of, you know, however many booms you're going to have, for solving yeah. a really serious problem. Do you know that it's going to work, or is there still an element of luck or chance <laughs> about it? Yeah, I mean, we're, of course, only certain once the first system has worked. And especially at the beginning, I, I really didn't have an, a, 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 really a clue whether it could work, but I thought, considering the scale of the problem, uh, it was at least important to try. And, you know, I think really the, the way to solve this, ah, so here what we see is the, the garbage patch if we don't clean it up in 2030 and if we do. So uh, this is kind of the thing that, um, you know, that keeps us motivated. Um, but you know, in, in general, I think there are way too many um, sort of low risk, low reward projects in the world. Um, you know, when you think about, I, I really believe that we have to uh, approach problem solving in the way as venture capitalists uh, approach investment, right? So uh, a venture capitalist would never fund a local grocery store, for example. You know, they would, but they, you know, a local grocery store, you know, it may be a great business, you know, it would work, uh, but, you know, it's not going to be the next Facebook, probably. So uh, what VCs do is they put money in, in 10 companies, uh, and probably nine of 10 wouldn't work, but the one that does work actually um, will be massive. And I think, you know, we really have to aim at these uh, high-risk, high-reward projects. Some of them may fail, but if they succeed, you know, then they have the potential to actually solve the whole problem. Now, I'm not denigrating your, your motives here, but I'm keen to know what is driving you. Is it the prospect of cleaning up the oceans, or is it the prospect of, as an entrepreneur, coming up with something that, frankly, could make you extremely successful and, and very wealthy? Or does it not matter if the oceans get... I mean, w w which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, I mean, ideally it would be both, but, of course, we are a non-profit, um, so uh, the latter is quite unlikely. Um, but, uh, but you must have a hope of making some money out of it some way, somehow. Um, mm. I mean, it... Come on, it's I, a business forum. You can, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean... Profit's the, not a dirty word. You know, I, for me, I'm an inventor, and um, for me, the... Um, you know, the um, the biggest motivation is sort of the, you know, if you have an idea and see that become reality, uh, I really think there's no better in the, uh, feeling in the world uh, than that. So, so having this idea of cleaning the ocean and seeing that become reality, uh, you know, that's at least enough motivation for me. What a, why? 
No, thank you. Yeah. Well, why the oceans and not the rainforests? I mean, I, I'm not suggesting you put booms in the rainforest. <laughs> what, no, why, in the great multitude of, uh, of issues, one person's asked, unfortunately I deleted it before I could bring it up <laughs> on the screen, which shows my technical expertise, why the oceans and, uh, versus anything else? Um, I mean, I think, there, of course, there are many uh, problems in the world, but if you sort of look at the, the, you know, the big picture, um, you know, over the past several hundred years, uh, thanks to technology, thanks to our tools, we've made uh, tremendous progress in many different fields. Um, I think for most people in the world, today, it's really the best time to be alive. If you think about wealth, health, education, of reduction in violence, increase in democracy, etc. I think we've done a tremendous job. Uh, but, you know, thanks to this um, you know, technology, uh, there have also been certain side effects of that uh, development that now creates all these problems. And I think it's, um, yeah, I think really to, to solve this problem, uh, or the, the problems of our time, the, the only way to do that is to also embrace that power of technology, right. uh, to also solve that. And of course, there's no better symbol for that than uh, you know, cleaning up the largest ecosystem in the world. And this will be the largest cleanup in history. And I hope that this can be a symbol of how we can use technology to also uh, make things better again. Let's have some quick fire questions from yeah. the people. Right. So bring up, bring up the chart first. How much plastic is there in the ocean? Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's in the order of um, about 1 million tons of, uh, of, of plastic. So, um, yeah, so that's about um, uh, 100,000 garbage trucks, uh, approximately. And how much of that do you hope to be able to pull out? Yeah, so if we have deployed the full fleet of systems, we can clean up 50% in five years. And of course, the next 50% would take another five years. So you would never get, get out every last kilo of plastic. But uh, we should be, say, 90% lower by 2040 is the, is the goal. Question from what? Oh, thank you again. Good audience. Yeah. You like this one, don't you? You like <laughs> his idea. All right. Thank How you. many of you would invest in it? Put your hand up. How many would you invest? All right, let me just start taking we some We also names. have a website. Um. Actually, how many of you have got any real money to invest in it? Gentlemen at the front. <laughs> Gentlemen at the front. Kept his hand up. Next question. <laughs> what are the possible uses for ocean plastic, and how can I buy it? So yeah. I understand that the, because I heard you describing it to Sir Richard yesterday, you shred it on the boats. Uh, yeah, so what we do is we, we just do a few simple steps to reduce the volume at sea, but really the only process, the, the, the real processing happens on land. So once it comes on land, we, you know, we wash it, we shred it, um, we um, you know, add a few additives and we sort it in different polymer types and you know, we sort the nets from the hard plastics, etc. Uh, and that way we can actually get high quality uh, material out of this. Uh, and the idea is that we uh, sell that with a license fee for our brand so that you can actually use this material in, say, uh, the, the dial plate of your watch or the dashboard of your, your next car or the chair of your company, et cetera. So, um, so really, this will be not a normal material. It will be um, you know, a special material with emotional value. And we think that through that extra branding value, we can actually make the cleanup self-sustainable. How do you prevent, from Aku, how do you prevent fish and sea life from being sucked in? or caught up in your booms? Sure, so, so we actually don't use any nets. I think that's quite a, a common misconception that, that we're using nets. It's actually a non-permeable uh, screen, so it's like a curtain. And what happens is that the ocean current really chooses the way of least resistance, which is underneath these screens. So what happens is that everything with a neutral buoyancy, things like fish, plankton, etc., get sucked underneath these barriers, while the plastic, which floats, remains in front of it. So that way we're able to separate the two uh, relatively easily. And, and how far does this net go down? Or, or it's not a net. So, uh, well, whatever, whatever, <laughs> Richard, what, did you listen? I did. Whatever it is, that, whatever uh, it is. Whatever, well, no, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. There is something that goes down. That yeah. yeah, yeah. Isn't there? there is something that's going on. It's under a the screen. Water. It's a screen. It's okay. a screen. Yeah. Oh, sorry. A screen is not a net. Exactly. So it goes down four meters. Um, so that's enough for most of the plastic. We measured it. And, and, that, and that screen, not a net, is the length or just at one end? Um, it's all the way, yeah. Sounds like a net. 
But don't worry, it's a screen. And that has holes in it. That's the difference. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so this screen doesn't have holes in it, but, but yeah. that just goes down to uh, four, four meters, you say? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and, and, that were, and that will be enough not to, to, to entrap any fish or, or, or sea, sea. Correct. Excellent. Right. Um, next question. Um, here we go. How does a boy in, does your solution address the problem of microplastics in the deeper ocean layers? Sure. So what happens with the plastic at sea is that over time it breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces due to UV light, uh, it fragments, it becomes more brittle and breaks down into these very tiny pieces. Uh, and the smaller these pieces get, the, the more dangerous they get as well, because then they end up in the fish, of course. Uh, you know, the good news is that right now, only just a few percent of the plastic at sea are these very tiny pieces. Um, but the, um, and we'll probably catch some of them, but not all of them, because they really get down to the you know, micrometer size, and, and then it's just, uh, you know, then it's just like the water just goes everywhere. Um, but the, uh, on the other hand, right now, we still have that, say, 95% of plastic um, that hasn't turned into microplastics yet, which is out there just waiting to be turned into microplastics. So in other words, it's sort of like a, a, a ticking time bomb. So what we do is by removing all that big stuff as well, we prevent the creation of all this new microplastics over the next few decades. So, uh, so in other words, uh, cleanup, you could consider that to be prevention too. <laughs> Related to that, it's important, I think, that we understand you're not trying to get every single piece. It's, uh, it's unrealistic to do yeah. that. But any improvement is better than none whatsoever. Yeah, and I think 90% is still pretty good. But yeah, um, <laughs> that's my, my opinion. But, yeah. All right, so. Uh, how, how about uh, th this one? How did you pitch, this is from Amaya, how did you pitch this idea to the venture capitalists? So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm hard-nosed venture capitalist who really doesn't care too much about um, plastic in ocean. Sure. Convince me. Yeah, okay, so we've not, <laughs> we've not done any um, you know, VC funding uh, at this point in time. It's just, uh, uh, you know, we are a foundation, so everything has been philanthropy so far. Uh, but I think that some of these people are investors too. So... Um, yeah, I think one thing they, um, yeah, that I think really helps is to show that it's uh, not a, a bottomless pit, right? That, it's, that there will be an end game and you can actually you know, show the graph and you see it coming down. We'll have peak plastic in 2020 coming down quite rapidly to, uh, to 2040. So I think that really helps and also but the fact of the, the financial self-sustainability. How difficult has that curve been yeah. to convince, even philanthropists, yeah. you come up with an idea that sounds a bit harebrained, yeah. but you're convinced it's going to work, yeah. and no amount of conviction of the 23-year-old, sure. or 22 or 21 when you were at that yeah. stage. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, at, at the beginning, it was certainly quite hard, especially, you know, we started when I was 18, and, uh, you know, nobody really wanted to give any money, and nobody wanted to help. And then one day, I did this, um, you know, this little TEDx presentation, and that went viral on the internet. It was being shared millions of times, which sort of got it, got it started. Uh, and then I was able to do an initial crowdfunding campaign, uh, raised uh, $90,000. 90, $90, uh, and with that $90,000, we then were able to make uh, the first milestone. And then we communicated that first milestone. And with that communication, we were able to do the second fundraising round, which was a, a 2.2 million crowdfunding campaign. With that, we made the next milestone, et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of a, a spiral staircase. In other words, you know, what I'm telling the team always is, you know, don't worry about the funding as long as we make that next milestone. As long as you guys succeed, I think that the funding will come automatically. And it's sort of this accelerating staircase. And you know, the first round was 90K, and like the, the most recent round was uh, 22 million. So, um, and hopefully, you know, the next one, you know, the next big milestone is actually having the first full-scale system out there and proving the technology. Uh, and hopefully after that, again, that will spur interest from companies to actually uh, buy the next uh, you know, 10, 20 systems. This is a fascinating question. Come, it's an anonymous one. What would you say to a person who dumps his or her trash in the ocean? Now, I understand that a lot of the trash here is either off ships yeah. or it's, it's from, from coastlines. It's sometimes not deliberate. But what would you say to the people here who are careless in their trash? Yeah, shame on you, I guess. Is that a, <laughs> a good answer? Um, yeah, I mean... I'm, it's obviously better not to, um, 
But at the other time, uh, on, on the other side, I think really to, you know, to solve this problem, of course, we, you know, we shouldn't litter. We should make sure that the plastic ends up in, in, in the right thing. Uh, but on the other hand, I think to put the fate of the, uh, of the ocean in the hands of 7.2 billion people, some of whom actually have the first priority to, to find food for you know, tonight, I think would be uh, you know, a, a bit unfair. So I think um, we really have to think about you know, how can technology help us here. And finally, from Alina, Boyan, I want to help. How can I work with you? Yeah. Um, so if you visit theoceancleanup.com, um, I think uh, you know, you, you feel free to, to get in touch. So we're always looking for uh, you know, the, the, the best people to, to work with us in our team. Um, and on the other hand, we're, we're always looking for companies and individuals you know, willing to you know, fund the next ocean cleanup system. So eventually we'll need 60 and you can have your own. Um, and uh, I think this will be really the most tangible way to, to rid the world's oceans of plastic. Get your pocketbook out and start writing checks. Ladies and gentlemen, when you think about what Boyan has come up with, I ask yourself, just think, what were you doing at age 18 while he was inventing mean. and coming up with this solution? Ladies and gentlemen, Boyan Slat.